This might be one of the biggest influencer skincare scams ever. I don't know. If you know me, you know that I pay my fucking bills. Like for people to say. <laughs> yeah, tell that to 360 Sourcing Group. Today's video is one uh, that I've avoided making for like two years, but here we are. It has become the time. We do need to talk about this for the sake of consumer protection, for the sake of people understanding what goes on behind the scenes in the beauty business and when things go wrong so that you as a consumer can make informed decisions and decide where you want to put your money. If it's to ethical companies, if it's to cash grabs, if it's to celebrity marketing, or if it's to small startup companies that actually work really hard for that and to deserve sales and therefore monetary funds to continue growing and doing the ethical, eco-friendly work that they do. But oh, ethical, eco-friendly, those are words that many people do not associate with Catherine McBroom or the Ace family. So let's start there. <laughs> so what is this 1212 Gateway skincare? Who is Catherine McBroom? And who is my lawyer? Because I am not a lawyer and all of this this is alleged. Obviously, everyone is innocent until proven guilty within the court of law. This is all alleged. This is all speculative. And we are just piecing things together and, you know, <laughs> seeing where it takes us. 1212 Gateway is the skincare line that was created by influencer Catherine McBroom. And she is part of the Ace Family. The Ace Family is a YouTube family vlogging channel that, um, mm, they're nefarious for many reasons, from different allegations of what the husband has done to certain people to the way that they use their children in content to gain views and clicks, which has been happening a lot more recently with the questionable antics of what happens at home and the way they treat their children on camera for the sake of getting clicks and views, potentially, allegedly, to jack up ad revenue because of the lawsuits that are now allegedly being served to them. But this has been an all around kind of problematic situation for years. And years ago, it was 2019 that I found out about their existence. And I made a very conscious decision not to discuss the brand or any of these things because frankly, I just didn't have the mental energy. And I still don't, but at least now I have caffeine. The public track record of this YouTube family who has chosen to put themselves out there very publicly is not always the best, but a lot of people choose to watch this sort of content because they find it cathartic. It's an escape from the real world. Uh, they definitely have clickbait titles or things that you have a hard time not clicking and not watching. For instance, did this child get bit by a family dog? That is emotionally and like primally concerning. And so we as humans tend to click on that. And um, it's very obvious that certain YouTube channels know how to exploit that to get your clicks and therefore your ad revenue. All in all, these clickbait titles have been going on for quite a while and so have other lawsuits. For instance, this family built a house and didn't want to pay people. Now, why is that relevant, Cassandra? I'm glad you asked. It's because apparently, allegedly, they also built a skincare line and then didn't pay for it. And now they actually tried to steal it away from their skincare partners and are getting sued. And when we talk about stealing a skincare line, we're not talking about like shoplifting a product and just putting it in your bag and walking out of the store. No, we're talking about stealing an entire brand away from co-founders or people who own legal stake, probably equity, AKA kind of like a percent of a specific company. And this is just insanity. And from looking at it from the outside in, it's almost a story of influencer entitlement and also a cautionary tale of influencer actuality, because just because you have 18 million subscribers doesn't mean that you can actually be a successful business person or sell a product, which we're going to speak about because I have uh, some thoughts on the actual cost of creating this skincare line and um, how much or how little profit it has actually made because the skincare line is what Catherine McBroom, the mom slash wife of the Ace family decided to create. Now, what is her history with skincare? Why did she create a skincare line? I have no clue. I don't think she's passionate about it. I don't know her well enough to say. Is this always been a project? Did her mom grow up giving her facials and caring about her? Or is this just a cash grab similar to the other cash grabs that they have been involved in? I do not know. But I will say that when the marketing for 1212 or 1212 Gateway came out, um, it's beautiful. It's very meditation meets mermaid meets music video. And if you actually watch like the promo content, it is beautiful. And that's exactly what Catherine McBroom was 
involved in this to do. She is the face of the line. She is the celebrity endorser. She's not the chemist. She's not the formulator. I don't know if she's technically a founder. She's not even the CEO or the COO, but she is the face and responsible for the marketing and promotion of this. And she's worked with primarily one other company, but actually quite a few other companies to make this happen, which brings us to our first point. When it comes to skincare lines, how are they created when it involves people? And there are primarily three ways. The first is the rarest and the hardest, and it's doing everything from scratch. It's having a person who is either a chemist or has a passion or is a dermatologist and is doing things from scratch. Sometimes from their kitchen, if they're making soap with lye and glycerin on their floor, which yes, I had a friend who did that for quite a while. And sometimes it's someone like Ron Robinson who came from the traditional cosmetic world and said, I know the chemistry behind this. I have access to a lab. I'm gonna create something that I believe in. That is obviously the hardest and um, usually the most treacherous, but arguably also the most authentic and transparent because you have the person who is directly responsible for the creation and the formation of this, having that experience, knowledge, and backing that up through years of bringing it to light. Normally the goal of those skincare lines is actually to get acquired by a large parent company. If you've heard of Unilever or Procter & Gamble or L'Oreal, Johnson & Johnson, these are all large companies that own companies underneath them. And a lot of the companies that you see like NYX Cosmetics or Urban Decay, they're both owned by the same parent company. That parent company can give them access to other brands, to marketing, to supply chains, and obviously take some of the income from that. But some brands operate with autonomy and some are kind of a part of this big Big brand family. Just the way The Ordinary is part of the Estee Lauder parent company or Fenty Skin is part of the Kendo parent company. Which brings us to the second type of skincare line, the Caring Concerned Endorsement. Think of Fenty Skin with Riri. Think of Covey with Emily. Think of something like Josie Moran or Wander Beauty. These are all celebrity skincare lines, but these lines are created specifically with a parent company and they're usually heavily intertwined. They're not always celebrity either. As an example, take Beauty Pie. This was created by Marcia Kilgore. She was also the one who did like Soap and Glory and Bliss. And she decided to basically make her own company that works with the manufacturers of these large luxury companies to bring luxury beauty to people at an affordable price. You can think of it as a non-legal sort of partnership where you have a person with knowledge or who's kind of being a spokesperson and then a larger backing or a company that come together to create something. This is also where you see a lot of spin-off companies. So for example, Glow Low Recipe is wonderful. It was two people who worked in the corporate world who decided to create their own skincare line. And then they created Sweet Chef, which is basically a sister company to Glow Recipe, just kind of the way that The Ordinary has the sister company, Nyad or Hylamide. And these are all kind of within their own families, but they're very much intertwined. They really stick to their authenticity. They stick to their roots. And anyone who works at or with these companies is literally immersed in the skincare, the marketing, the science, or whatever department that they do. Now, the third type, is when we see these celebrity cash grabs or when we see a person, usually someone of fame, status, or notoriety who knows nothing about business, nothing about skincare, nothing about aesthetics or dermatology or anatomy or chemistry, who decides to walk in and say, hey, I want to earn some money. Who wants to make a product line and they basically take something that maybe already exists it's called private labeling or white labeling and bam they slap a new label on it there are companies actual manufacturers that do this for instance you can basically go in and they have all of these jars and vials and these pre-made formulas and you can literally just change the color and the smell and you can like add some raspberry extract and then slap your name on it and call it your own and that is how some small companies start their own brands and that's also how some celebrities such as Addison Rae or Catherine McBroom decide to create their skincare lines. And it's not, you know, deep involvement with the chemistry. It's not working on legal partnerships or joint ventures. It's literally, hi, I wanna take something that already exists, just kind of slap my name on it, tweak it a little bit and start to sell this stuff. And we've always seen that in the makeup world. We've done a video previously on how it started with these celebrity perfumes that we all saw at Kohl's and like every celebrity had a perfume. And then they all got these makeup lines and like half of them even had fashion lines like the Kardashians. And then what do you know, skincare is trendy. So 
Time to slap our name on some skincare. And while it's normally manufacturers that have these kind of libraries of base formulas that people just come in and, you know, put their own little scent in, large companies can actually do this too. L'Oreal, Unilever, some of these big, big brands, they have research and development companies underneath them that do a lot of clinical testing, which is great because it helps us to actually back up the claims that they're making, although there is a worry of bias. Basically, if you're the one who's paying for that research, is that research going to come out in your favor? That's always a concern. But there are even subsidiary companies that do work to literally scout the industry. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and if you've heard of the Silicon Valley, it's this idea of startups popping up here and there and acquisitions and raising venture capital to get acquired. And a lot of these big companies literally have dedicated teams of people that go out and look for these small companies that are already kind of flourishing to acquire and then again to invite them into their big families or who kind of have these libraries of cosmetics that large scale celebrities can come in and slap their names on. And depending on the scale of the celebrity, it can be more or less customized, but it is pretty safe to allege and to bet that many of the celebrities that we see launching skincare lines don't really know or care or have any connection to the products they're pushing other than the fact that it is making them money. And that is not all celebrities. That is not all influencers, but when we look at a legitimate celebrity or influencer skincare line versus something that just kind of feels like a name was slapped on it and it's like very suspicious and there are other products on the market that look very similar, that's when it starts to get fishy. So we have these three categories and when 1212 Gateway launched, again, they did a really good job. The packaging and branding is beautiful. The actual formula and the ingredients don't look bad. And Catherine McBroom is using her influence and her beauty and her insight to sell this. So what's the catch? Well, it's kind of like the car, right? The Ferrari, it looks so good at driving down the street, but when you open up the hood, you realize, this isn't a Ferrari, this is like a Toyota engine and they like put like a kit. They like cut and pasted the Ferrari emblem on the steering wheel and under the hood it is all falling apart. Which brings us to looking at this company's structure and how it was built and why Catherine McBroom is being sued for stealing her own company. Again, this is all alleged, but um, yes, literally a coup of a company. The Capitol insurrection, do you remember when, you know, the Capitol almost got overthrown? Yes, we are imagining that, but in the skincare world. And let's talk about how that can actually happen. When we look at the USPTO, the Patent and Trademark Office of the United States, it does show that 1212 Gateway was filed in 2020. The attorney that did this was based in Irvine, California, and all this is public knowledge, but we're still not going to dox anyone, so for that reason that some of these things are blurred. But this was an attorney in the Southern California area that lives very close by and appears to work with Catherine McBroom, or the Ace family in general. Now what's interesting is that when you look at 1212 Gateway, the company is actually a Delaware company, and the headquarters are actually listed in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, hi, I'm your Bay Area girl. Like I grew up every single summer flailing around in the ocean of Santa Cruz. Like I know exactly where this office is and I know exactly what else is in there. And when I saw this, oh, did I get suspicious? Like if I would have known this two years ago, I would have done this video way sooner and with half the amount of coffee. But essentially 1212 Gateway is a company located in Santa Cruz that is incorporated in Delaware. And why Delaware, you would say? Like, this is California. Like, she lives in California, the brand is in California, the manufacturing's in California, what's going on? Delaware is actually very business friendly. When you look at the different states in the United States of America, they have different business laws. And a lot of companies want to incorporate or establish themselves in Delaware. A lot of LLCs do that, a limited liability company, which is what 1212 Gateway is. And they do that in Delaware for either tax benefits or business Business benefits, etc. And again, I have a very, very heartbreaking story about a botched skincare line because I didn't know what I was doing at the time and I trusted people that I shouldn't have who, yes, also tried to incorporate that company in Delaware and then tell me that I didn't own the company after I'd worked for four years on it. So that sucked. <laughs> Anyways, for all intents and purposes, it is in California and um, it is very close by. I wonder if we should go and um, pay them a visit. 1212 Gateway happens to be at the very same office of some other skincare brands. And when you look at 1212 Gateway's website, you'll see at the bottom it says TBL Cosmetics. What is TBL Cosmetics, you may ask? Well, it says it very clearly on the website. TBL Cosmetics is more than a just 
cosmetics formulation company. They offer top-level management services and a comprehensive structure to each brand that they work with. They bring to the table a creative agency that ebbs and flows in a modern, evolving world. Their team works exceptionally well with celebrities, influencers, and major companies. They have a unique ability to accomplish brand awareness, generate massive sales, and bridge the gap between influencers, brands, and consumers. So TBL Cosmetics seems to be more of a management company, not completely an agency. In California, you have to be licensed and bonded to be a talent agency, but they seem to be kind of a management, a curation service that connects these amazing things. But when you dig deeper into TBL Cosmetics and specifically that address in Sokol, California in the Santa Cruz area, what else is there? A company called EnviroCan. Yes, a hemp and cannabis company. Another skincare line specifically titled her body and a badass biochemist who happens to work in that area has her own LLC and seems to work with not only this other skincare line called her body, but also with 1212 Gateway. Now I feel so bad for EnviroCan, for this badass biochemist, for this guy, for the two guys, there is so much going on over here and it looks like they are basically being royally screwed over by an influencer. All alleged, all my subjective opinion that I'm looking at from the outside. But when you see the other companies that are here and the work that they're doing, it's very different than what was promised by 1212 Gateway or what we saw publicly with how Catherine McBroom was promoting her cosmetic line. Again, all of the marketing for 12121 to whatever gateway is like literally yogi meditation meets like mermaid blue ocean glitters and like put it in a music video and I think it's done beautifully the marketing and advertising is arguably gorgeous the packaging is gorgeous which is going to be the next debacle that we talk about which is where this uh, $750,000 lawsuit is coming from but as far as the actual cosmetic formulation goes it looks really good and that's why a year and a half ago when it came out I was like is this even worth talking about because like okay it's obvious that Catherine McBride didn't do this, but like, it's not bad. There were some issues in the way the products were packaged and delivered. Some people said that they saw pubes or nose hairs. Sometimes the packages got kind of shook up with shipping, but it was nothing compared to Trisha Skin's Miracle Elixir. A whole different ballpark when you compare it to that. And when you actually look at EnviroCan, this hemp and cannabis company seems to really care about what they're doing. It looks like they started in or around 2019. And yes, it's by some of the very same people that are involved with 1212 Gateway. And when you actually look at this team of people and professionals, you have a CEO with experience. You have a COO who seems to really care about management. You have a biochemist who's a total badass and a yogi. And you have people that genuinely seem to know and care about what they're doing. And then you have a celebrity or an influencer who comes in with a promise of being able to sell amazing, wonderful cosmetics, but does that promise get delivered on? If you look at their website, it tells a very interesting story, and let's actually read that. It specifically says, 1212 Gateway sold out and did over $1 million in 30 minutes at our launch on December 12th of 2020. We then sold out again with our restock event two weeks later on December 26th. Now, I do question this. I want to believe it, I want to think it's true, but when you actually look at the numbers and how things sell and how much they cost to make, I don't know if this adds up. And seeing as everything is right now 30% off on the site, seeing how Catherine McBroom and the Ace family are under multiple allegations of lawsuits, and seeing as how they have publicly spoken about or have had loans taken out, allegedly, things do get very suspicious. When we look at this 1212 Gateway line being affiliated with TBL, the Bottom Line Cosmetics, and we see that the Bottom Line Cosmetics and the badass biochemist who is in all of these photos with Catherine McBroom has also helped to create Her Body Cosmetics, we can look at the ingredients of both of these. And Her Body has some very interesting CBD products. Now this is a discussion for another time because there's a lot of hype around CBD. There's a lot of hype around hemp and a lot of very sketchy, scammy companies are making a lot of hemp claims 
symptoms that aren't stood up. Hemp is not going to cure your eczema or your psoriasis or your acne. Those are medical conditions. Now our body does have an endocannabinoid system and hemp can be very helpful for some people. Hemp is different. By the way, hemp is different than full spectrum CBD oil, which is different than regular CBD oil. This gets deep and the way each oil is extracted or processed or the amount of terpenes in it, like it gets very deep into the science and a lot of cash grabby companies don't care. Now, when it comes to this environment eco company, it seems like they actually care when it comes to this badass biochemist. She has the studies and the data and the experience to back it up. So while I have not tried this Her Cosmetics line, it actually looks pretty good. And as long as they're not making medical claims, I'm like, hey, it's not gonna cure your dog's diabetes. But I mean, if you wanna put it on your ankles, it looks hydrating, okay? But 1212 Gateway it looks suspiciously similar to some of the active ingredients and some of the formulas. And seeing as the main biochemist for both companies happens to be the same person. I am honestly not surprised. Now, when we dig a little bit deeper into kind of what's going on here, there's another party as well, and it looks to be more of a management or an accounting firm. It's specifically called Bluke's Financial, and this seems to be an accounting firm, so somebody who kind of counts money and helps to make sure that the finances are all good, but it looks like they do a little bit more as well. Potentially payroll solutions and logistics, so making sure that employees get paid on time. Potentially HR solutions, so if there's internal conflicts or sexual harassment, then this is the company that might be taking care of that, which they wouldn't be taking care of that for the McBroom family, but the McBroom family might want to look into someone like that who's like an HR specialist or a lawyer, because again, there's a lot going on there. But this Blukes Financial also appears to do some sort of wealth or asset management. Basically, when you get to being a McBroom status or having these sorts of companies, you have to make sure that the company is making smart financial decisions, and you have to make sure that that wealth is allocated in different areas so that it is protected as a hedge against inflation. For instance, we're going to the store and everything's becoming more expensive. A lot of large companies that could wipe out $100,000 or a million dollars of their profits if they don't allocate that appropriately. So that's what some of these companies do. I don't know if this Blukes Financial one does that, but when you actually look at Blukes Financial, it's actually owned and operated by someone called like badass accountants. So first off, yeah, badass accountants, they seem great. But also like, is this like a holding company on top of a holding company? And then who owns Blukes Financial? Like, is this something to do with the McBroom family? Is it a completely separate entity? I don't know. If someone else wants to look into that, be my guest. That is not my expertise. I am not a journalist. I am just someone who wants to feel good about applying my moisturizer. God, life is hard. But it appears that there are multiple parties involved in this, which is why when Catherine allegedly staged this coup of the company, it got very, very messy, very, very quick. Now this is all speaking about the management of the company. This is the team that is creating the formula and the manufacturing and coordinating all of that in Santa Cruz. And they're also running the website. Looks like it was hosted on godaddy.com. That's like if you have a URL, basically at the top of the screen, you wanted to say a certain name, like 1212 Gateway, that's GoDaddy. But then how the page is actually structured, what it looks like, how you can add things to cart, looks like they were using Shopify to do that. And all of that was again being managed by this company that involves Catherine, but there are these two two guys and this biochemist and a bunch of other people that are making this happen. And they are in Santa Cruz. Now, outside of that, there's of course this financial or payroll company. There's probably other parties and logistics and legal things involved. So again, who's shipping and fulfilling the products? Who's the lawyer who's making sure that everything looks good? But then there's also the design company the packaging. Now they could be doing packaging and filling and logistics, but essentially they're responsible for these really beautiful bottles. They're responsible for the color gradient and for the logo and for the style of this. That's not Catherine. She's not a Photoshop queen and an expert in Adobe After Effects. Looks like there is this separate company called 360 Sourcing Group that is just that a sourcing group. So they are sourcing the different components of this package. When you think about a skincare product, think about all the things that go into it. Yes, you have the formulation, what's inside of the product, but then you have this primary packaging. Something has to stabilize this and transport this liquid, right? Then you have to put it into this secondary packaging. You have to have something that has legal requirements about how you label this. And then you need tertiary packaging. Are you putting this in some sort of a package with other products? And then are you putting this in a shipping 
shopping box or a container to get it out. And once you have 50,000 or 100,000 of these, where do you put them? Where do you store them in a warehouse before someone orders them? And when they do, how do you do what's called a pick and pull and basically put all of these different orders in a basket? You best believe that Catherine McBroom and her family and her kids and her husband are not sitting there packaging these boxes. This is probably what's called a third party logistics group or someone like 360 Sourcing who is helping coordinate that so that when you make an order online through the Shopify store that's done by a one to one to gateway, there is another party that helps to ship that out and to get it to someone's doorstep, either through FedEx or USPS or DHL, etc. And again, when it comes to uh, the alleged pubes or hairs found in the product or the fact that the product was like thrown around, th that could have been the FedEx guy kicking it on your doorstep, like right past Fido. That could have been him, it could have been anyone down the chain. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the brand's fault, but normally a good brand who has the financial backing will try to make it right by saying, hey, sorry your stuff done got fucked up and banged around. We're gonna replace it free of charge because you know, it leaked. <laughs> Trisha skin. Now all of this seems well and good. The structure seems nice. The company seems cool. So what's going wrong? Well, my friend, that is when we get into allegedly, apparently all alleged, the lawsuits about what Catherine McBroom did. As you can see, there are many parties here. There are many people involved with this. Just to create a single product, if you own the IP, the intellectual property, you're looking at like $30,000 minimum, 35 grand. And if you want to create an entire skincare line, you're looking at 150, $200,000. That's not even all of the cost of raw materials. That's not even the packaging and the shipping. That is just the intellectual property. So you can see how the research and development behind this, it adds up very fast. And that doesn't even include the amount of money it costs to pay someone's salary and to keep the lights on. Now, I have a feeling that Catherine McBroom or the Ace family does not own the intellectual property, or at least they didn't at the time. I am guessing and assuming that she did not own the formula. She did not own the how-to, basically the recipe of how to create her own skincare. She's the face of this. She's slapping her name on it. I'm almost sure that she has what's called equity. Basically think of a pie. You wanna split that pie up between people and you have different voting rights. Who gets to say what happens with the company? Is the packaging blue or red? You can take votes within a company based on the members of that LLC. And that way, when you're enjoying the pie, you know, mom who cooked the pie is gonna get a bigger, better slice and have more say over how she divvies the pie up versus someone who did very little work or put very little financial backing into it. Now that's how it's supposed to work. And I don't know exactly the structure of this company or exactly how this LLC was formulated and what sort of rights or privileges each member of this LLC had, but I'm sure that Catherine McBroom has a portion of it. Now I don't think she owns the whole thing. The guy, let's just call him I, He's the CEO. There's another dude that is the COO. There's this other person that is the biochemist and there are many people and parties behind the scenes that we don't even see. I can almost guarantee you that Catherine does not own 100% of the company. And that's why when the company started to make money, allegedly, as according to the website, a million dollars in a couple days and then selling out in another two weeks, she decided they're taking a lot of this money. I don't want them to take this money, so I'm just gonna steal the company. <laughs> Imagine you living at home, you have a roommate, you have a couple roommates, maybe a few family members you live with, right? And you have your room, that is your space. You get to help clean up the living room and the family room and do the dishes, you do your part, but you've got your thing that you can rely on, right? Imagine your roommates or your housemates or your family coming together and basically kicking you out of your room and ripping all of your stuff out, changing the locks and saying, you can't have this anymore. And you're like, excuse me, I'm a functioning member of this house. Like what is going on? I'm a part of this. I've worked for this. This is my space. I have rights to this. What are you talking about? And someone locks you out, throws away the key and says, no, you, you can't live here anymore. You literally cannot do that to evict someone in California. It's like six months, right? That is the equivalent of what Catherine McBroom allegedly tried to do to basically everybody here. As we mentioned, this company located in Santa Cruz under the name 1212 Gateway wasn't just Catherine and her face. This also involved people who had the website, who had the logins, the passwords, the connections, and the financial how-tos of how all this works and how people get paid. Apparently, Catherine McBroom tried to come in and just changed all the passwords. She locked everyone out and said, no, this is like mine now. 
And she basically just tried to steal the passwords, redid the credit card numbers, tried to get everything to go to her accounts. Like I don't even know or understand like how this can go through someone's mind where they think this is okay to just cut other people completely out of the deal. When they've worked on this and there's probably legal things to back up the fact that they're entitled to a lot of what's going on there and you probably have to vote in order to do that. But no, she just decided my face is on it. I'm just gonna <laughs> round with this and just kick everyone out. And um, what happened? Well, the website went down for two weeks and this caused, you can imagine, a substantial financial loss to the company. Maybe she sold the first million or maybe the first million sold out. But if you don't have a website, you can't keep selling those things. And as you saw, Catherine started to promote this, you know, very quickly, but the promotion kind of died down. And when you look at 12121211 Gateway, is this actually a brand that you are excited to go out and buy? Do you see it on the shelves at Whole Foods or do you see it like, you know, on Sephora and you're like, ooh, I want that because it's great for my skin. No, many people buy that because she's promoting it. And the second she stops promoting it, it doesn't do so well. And this is also where we start to get into celebrity marketing. Just because you have 18 million followers doesn't mean that you're a good business person or an honest business person, allegedly, but it also doesn't mean that you can necessarily sell things. Just because you have something doesn't mean that people want it. Doesn't mean that it's providing value. Doesn't mean that it matches the target demographic. Look at who's watching the Ace Family. Shockingly enough, it's a lot of young children. They wanna watch this family because it's entertaining. They have some sort of an affinity or a connection. Yes, there are probably parents or other people who watch as well. With 18 million people, of course, there's a huge amalgamation. But that target demographic is probably much younger than the Ace Family or than Catherine themselves. And so she's selling skincare to a group of primarily young people who either don't have the funds or who just don't have the interest in this product. Now, again, the reason that a million of them allegedly already sold is because of course there's a subcategory there of, you know, moms or target demographic or young men or people who care about their skin who are like, yes, I love Catherine, I'm going to buy this. Just because an influencer puts their name on it doesn't mean it's all good and dandy. And again, I'm trying to skirt around the thing without saying the things that I can't say. I'm very grateful to have worked with some very amazing people and companies, and I know some things that are protected under what's called an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, so I'm not going to disclose them. But let me say, you can be an influencer with 5 million, with 7 million, or with 10 million followers, and you can sell less than 100 items. You can sell less than 1,000. You can have a product that absolutely flops. And it's like, okay, if I'm sitting here, like I'm vegan, I'm cruelty free. If I sit here and tell you like, go buy this steak at a steakhouse. Some people might be like, okay, Cassandra, but the majority of people are gonna be like, what the f like that makes no sense. Or if I sit here and all of a sudden I decide to launch tennis rackets and tennis balls and I'm like, you guys, I love tennis. You'll be like, okay, Cassandra, we get that you like tennis, but that's not primarily what you do. That's not why we care about you or what we know you for. So if I already like tennis, yeah, maybe I'll buy your tennis stuff to like support you. That's just kind of weird and it's not what I'm here for. Whereas if it's skincare, if it's a coffee mug, even merch, a lot of people think that merch is a legitimate business. In a way, yes it is, but a merch line is not a clothing company. A merch line is a way to support an influencer and hopefully the influencer is ethical, but the actual business of beauty is very different than the influencer marketing side. And that is, I think, at the core of this issue as well. When you have a traditional company, such as these cosmetic manufacturers and these CEOs and COOs and biochemists who really care about what they do and they see someone that they think will promote things and that will make them a ton of money, it makes sense to try to work together, right? It makes sense to try to do that. But if one side of the parties is dishonest or if it flops or if they've inflated their numbers or if they think that they can sell because they have a whole bunch of followers, but those followers only care about the entertainment and not about the product or the item, it's really difficult to push sales. Being an entertainer or a family vlogger on YouTube is very different than being an advisor on products or skincare. It's very different than being a salesperson. And arguably, if you're trying to be a salesperson, you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't be trying to sell people things. You should be creating things of value that people want and need and solving a problem for them. And that is true entrepreneurship versus the Sammy Scales and the influencer marketing and like the questionable NFTs, right? Even if you just get out of like the blockchains and the cryptocurrencies, you have these influencers promoting like gambling. And arguably a gambling app would do better for Catherine McBroom and the Ace Family's audience because 
their audience is young and their audience is on phones and cares about games and these fun things and unfortunately is prone to being exploited, which is also what's happening to their children. Again, all of this is opinions, all of this is alleged. But I think what I'm really trying to say here is that just because you have followers doesn't mean that you're going to be successful in business. And I think that if a business comes together with multiple parties under false pretenses and then has basically the rug pulled out from underneath them because value is not being created for a customer, what is being created, a product or a formula, is not getting to the customer that actually needs it. The people who are involved are more concerned about stealing money from other people and like cutting them out of the pie or out of the share rather than doing something that's ethical or working on future products or future launches. And you can see where this causes a huge issue. And there is apparently a $30 million lawsuit that has been going around for a little while on this. Now, again, I am not a lawyer. I hope that a lawyer like Emily D. Baker or Legal Eagle starts to speak about this. If you want me to call up a lawyer friend, let me know. But I would be very interested to see someone who's actually a lawyer look at some of these papers and see what's being filed and what's being claimed. And a lawsuit for the amount of $30 million said that Catherine McBroom didn't do what she was supposed to. She tried to steal the company away from her her business partners or the people who were actually working and managing this day to day. On March 10th, she goes and locks everyone out, allegedly. Even if your products and formulas are ethical, that doesn't mean that the people who are running it are. And that's the very scary nature of the beauty business. A lot of people don't realize you don't have to be a biochemist. You don't have to be a dermatologist. You don't have to be an esthetician. You don't even have to be a cosmetic marketer, a formulator, someone with experience. You can be anyone to start a skincare or makeup line. That doesn't mean that you know what you're doing. Doing. And that doesn't mean that you're an honest person because what are companies run by? Humans. And what are humans? Humans. Humans have flaws. Humans have issues. And there are some humans that are very dishonest. Now, to Catherine Broom's defense, it sounds like she had made promises to return these things, to return the social accounts. But you can imagine the people who are actually the ones responsible for managing this day to day, who are looking at how many items were sold, managing returns, making sure that the third party logistics company has everything they need, making purchase orders. They're sitting here and they're like, uh, we can't do shit. We are locked out. And then if the website goes down and Catherine McBroom's not a coder, does she understand JavaScript? You know, is she looking at the Facebook pixel? I think not. So you can imagine if a website goes down for two weeks and if they're supposed to make a million dollars every two weeks, that could be very, very costly. But that's not the only lawsuit. Remember, there is also this 360 sourcing group, the company who actually helped with the branding, allegedly, or the packaging, allegedly, the company that is responsible for a lot of that design and potentially some of those logistics. Apparently, they got screwed over as well. This 360 group is suing TBL, the bottom line, for an amount of around $750,000, basically for breaching contract. Now remember, this the bottom line company seems to be affiliated with Catherine McBroom, but it also involves these other companies in Santa Cruz. And I don't know exactly how these are structured or who they're owned by, but it sounds like there's a breach of contract over here, probably because of what Catherine McBroom did. And now this company that did their work turned it in on time, was selling it to people, they didn't get paid. The 360 branding and creative company basically had an amount of $719,000 that was not paid by either Catherine McBroom or by this the bottom line company. And shockingly, they actually reached an agreement where Catherine McBroom and the bottom line are basically going to pay them back for the work that they actually did and the services that they rendered. Although the amount in dispute was $719,000, it's now up to 763, probably because of interest or legal fees or damages. I don't exactly know. Again, not a lawyer. And again, all of this is alleged. Now, apparently they are being asked to pay in monthly installments, about $50,000 a month. Now, when you look at this, okay, well, who is paying? And specifically, the reason that this is also concerning for us as consumers is because if Catherine McBroom and her company is responsible for this, they already had some major financial losses. The skincare line right now does not look like it's selling. I'm sorry, who, who who's buying it? Are you buying it right now? Also, it's 30% off on the website. And 
when you actually look at Catherine McBroom and the Ace family as a whole, there are multiple lawsuits, multiple allegations. This is why the construction of the house was so important and pertinent. They purchased a house on some sort of a loan, bought the contracting company basically so they don't have to pay taxes or don't have to pay people. I don't understand because I am not a contractor. But they are operating off of debt and off of public perception. And there are many banks and many companies that will loan someone money based on their net value or their net worth. Just the way you can say, hey, I'm gonna get a credit card or I'm gonna get a loan for a car or a house. Some people who are at a certain status can do that with their image. They can borrow against their stock portfolios. If they have real estate, they can actually borrow and take money out of that. That's why some exploitive billionaires like Elon Musk or like Jeff Bezos or large companies don't have to pay taxes because they're not actually taking money out of their accounts, out of their stocks or portfolios, and they're actually taking out loans and borrowing against these large accounts. And when you take out a loan, it's gonna be a lot less than paying 40% taxes. Now, is that fair? <laughs> That's a conversation for another day. And is that happening? Again, I don't know, but I think it's important that you as the consumer of either a skincare product or just watching this play out online, you deserve to understand that there are tricks and secrets behind the scenes of how these things work. And can you imagine if you see a family who looks like they have it all, they have this huge house, they have all this money, they have the nicest designer clothing, you must think like, oh my God, like they're just earning so much money. You don't automatically think maybe there's a form of debt there, or maybe this is purchased on credit or on a loan. And imagine a business partner, a startup company that sees 18 million followers, but what's the quality of those followers? What's the engagement of those followers? And you can understand where a company could very easily get ripped off or exploited by someone who looks like they have it all together. When again, it looks like a Ferrari, but you open up the hood and there there is a mess there. And the question becomes, the McBrooms have to pay $50,000 allegedly every single month, you know, to this 360 party. They have other outstanding allegations against them. What does that mean for this company? Is it going to survive? Are they ever going to be able to afford to create new products? Is the ownership going to go to someone else completely? And we've noticed that in the past, the McBrooms have gotten into a lot of trouble for clickbaiting and for exploiting their children and content. We've seen a lot of very questionable click in the past couple of months. And we know that the more people that click that video, whether or not they enjoy it, if an ad plays before that video, the channel that serves that ad might get a tenth of a cent. So if 10 people watch an ad, that YouTube creator might get one penny. But if you're creating videos that get 3 million views, or you have 18 million subscribers who are watching all those videos, those pennies, those cents tend to add up. That's a video for another day if you wanna talk about CPMs and about the finances behind social media content creation, specifically on the YouTube platform that is run by Alphabet. But at the end of the day, the McBrooms need money. And we are seeing more clickbait, exploitative, questionable content, because what does it do? Fires up our amygdalas, the area in our brain that is responsible for this jarring emotion and fear. And it gets us to click on this because we're like, is this child okay? Did you let your child get bit by a dog? And the answer is no. Or did you put period blood on your husband's face? And the answer is no. But that gets the clicks, which gets the ad revenue, which helps them pay off their debt. But that also feeds this cycle of influencers doing bad or questionable things just to get clicks, just to get views, to earn money. And it creates this cycle of people who watch this, who start to normalize that, psychologically think that this behavior is okay. And it leads to people comparing themselves to the money that these people have or comparing their actions or how exciting their life is to this, thinking that their life is boring or these actions are okay. Or just comparing themselves and feeling insecure and stressed. You know, Catherine's sitting here promoting a skincare line, but she's had a lot of procedures and plastic surgery. Lori Hill did an amazing video breaking down what it costs to be Catherine McBroom and what Lori Hill thinks Catherine McBroom has had done. And when you see someone who looks the way she does, it's a very influencer look. A lot of young girls and young women sit here thinking, oh my God, like how come I can't look like her? And if I buy that skincare, am I finally gonna be able to get that? And the answer is no. And that's why it's important to see these things happening behind the scenes. And for us as consumers of both this media and this content, 
content as well as these products. We need to see this and kind of identify and be aware of this cycle that's happening so that we can say, hey, um, I know it's very alluring to want to click on this, but I'm either not going to feed into it because I know it's clickbait and I know it's not okay. Or if enough people come together and say, this isn't okay, maybe we can stop this cycle. If we can have content that goes viral because it's educational or entertaining in a good way or helpful, that would be so much better than this shocking, dramatic, emotionally provocative content. But as someone who literally creates content on the internet, I will tell you the reason all of my thumbnails make me look like a bitch is because if I smile, the thumbnail flops. We've done A-B testing. We've done analytics on this. If I'm smiling in a thumbnail, nobody clicks on it. But the second I'm like, everyone's like, oh, me. And it's because it triggers this area of our brains that is literally primally wired for it. And if you click on this video of a reaction video and you're actually getting some skincare knowledge education and you leave feeling better about acne positivity or about understanding your routine, then great. But if you're clicking and you're watching a child, a five-year-old being asked about a boyfriend and being exploited by her father on the internet, that's a whole different story. And then as consumers, if we are buying products and we don't know who's creating them, it's about the ingredients. It's about how they work. It's about the sourcing. It's about if they're cruelty free or not, but it's also making sure that we are lining the pockets of people who deserve that, of badass scientists and people who work for their money and care about the products and about serving the consumer, not just celebrities who are looking for another cash grab to slap their name on. This entire situation is insane and brands need to be very fearful of influencers and influencers need to be more self-aware. I feel like that's the issue. There appears to be very little self-awareness in the influencer sphere. And there are some people who are very self-aware, but as a viewer, it's very important to be aware of these things because I don't think that some of the large influencers who are more problematic really have that awareness right now. And as consumers, it's also a tale for us to be cautious of where we're putting our money, putting it where our morals are, and hopefully an interesting deep dive on how this stuff works behind the scenes, because it's a lot more complex and convoluted than most people might think. So let me know if I should call up a lawyer, if we should look at some of these things, if you want me to buy the skincare line at 30% off and test it, if you want me to go knock on their doors, huh? Foreshadowing? Foreshadowing. Anyways, make sure that you stay hydrated, reapply your SPF, preferably one that, you know, wasn't created as part of a cash grab, and always remember to be beautiful both inside and out. I love you, and I cannot wait to see you in this next video. <sighs> love you guys. Bye.